Okay. Um, so that's been about a minute or so. So we're going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome to the FPMRS Fellows Webinar Series. This is a joint effort between AUGS, SUFU, and SGS, and we are grateful for their support during this endeavor. I'm Kristen Bono, and I'm currently the third year FPMRS Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Pharmacological Treatment of Urinary Incontinence, which is presented by Dr. Cecile Ferrando, who is the FPRS Program Director and the Director of Transgender Surgery and Medicine Program at the Cleveland Clinic. Our panelists today include Dr. Elena Tanitsky from the Hartford Hospital and Dr. Emily Lucas from the University of California, San Diego. The webinar will feature a presentation for approximately 30 minutes followed by presentation of two clinical cases for discussion amongst the panelists. And finally, we'll spend the remaining 10 to 15 minutes answering questions from the attendees. Hang on one second, let me just get this to advance. Okay, um, in case anybody is watching here for the first time, I'd briefly like to review some housekeeping items. This webinar is being live streamed and recorded. All participants will be on mute, but please feel free to use the Q&A feature of the Zoom webinar to direct questions to the speaker or panelists. We will try to address as many questions as we can within the hour. Please feel free to use the chat feature if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. The AUG staff will be monitoring it and can assist you during the lecture. And at the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a brief survey and provide feedback about the session. I also wanted to let everybody know that our next webinar is scheduled for Friday, May 22nd at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time, titled Evaluation and Management of Postoperative Pelvic Pain by Dr. Chip Butrick. Please visit the AUGS website to sign up. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Ferrando. Let me just get my screen here. All right, good evening, everybody, or good afternoon for those of you on a uh, different time. I know one of our panelists is a little bit earlier than the rest of us, uh, including uh, including um, uh, our, our host uh, this, this evening. So I'm gonna talk about pharmacologic treatment of urinary incontinence. Uh, we're gonna review all of the medications that we use to treat um, the incontinences that we see in our offices. I have no disclosures relevant uh, to this topic. The objectives are for us to review both old and new uh, pharmacologic treatments for detrus overactivity and stress urinary incontinence. And we're gonna focus on some practical advantages and disadvantages of the most commonly used medications. And my goal is to try to make this as evidence-based as possible. So here are the dreaded neurophysiology, the uh, topic that everybody um, is nervous about when it comes to our in-service exam, um, as well um, as our boards. But it's important to understand this before we actually move on and talk about the medications themselves. Um, so understanding the normal physiology of the bladder of bladder activity makes it easy to understand the drugs that we use to treat bladder dysfunction. As urine fills the bladder, stretch receptors are activated. These receptors send impulses along the pelvic nerve afferent fibers to the spinal cord and on the sympathetic nucleus where the hypogastric nerve is activated. The resulting impulse is carried down to the hypogastric nerve to the bladder where beta adrenergic receptors cause bladder relaxation and alpha adrenergic receptors cause increased urethral smooth muscle tone. Urethral skeletal muscle tone is maintained through a different complementary system that originates in the sacral spinal cord um, where uh, Onof's nucleus is uh, located. Activity from this nucleus is conveyed along the pudendal nerve, which releases acetylcholine to stimulate excitatory nicotinic receptors and contraction of the striated urethral sphincter. When the bladder becomes distended to the point at which micturition should occur, activity from the pelvic nerve is carried up to the pontine micturition center, which causes activation of sacral parasympathetic neurons whose axons traverse the pelvic nerve and cause release of acetylcholine to stimulate excitatory muscarinic receptors and contraction of the detrusor muscle. Of course, the cerebral cortex comes into play as well and is very important because one should be able to suppress these stimuli if one's social situation does not lend itself to micturition. And so if you understand those basic pathways, you can understand why the medications we choose may, may or may not work. Um, and so I would say that before reviewing and studying pharmacology, it's really important to understand the neurophysiology behind it. 
we're going to start and spend the majority of the webinar lecture on detrusor overactivity, um, mainly because it's the urinary incontinence condition that um, that uh, has a uh, a significant pharmacologic or medication pathway when it comes to how we treat our patients. Um, so here are the medications that we use to treat detrusor overactivity. Um, Anti-muscarinics are administered both orally or transdermally. Beta-3 agonists and tricyclic antidepressants are taken orally. Botulinum toxin is injected into the detrusor muscle. I'm going to discuss each medication and review their sites of action, advantages, and disadvantages. We'll start with the anti-muscarinics, which are the most commonly used medications for bladder overactivity. These medications block muscarinic receptors, of which there are five types. The mediator at these receptors is acetylcholine. In the bladder, M2 receptors are more common. However, M3 receptors are thought to be more responsible for initiating bladder contractility. Antimuscarinics work by inhibiting or blocking acetylcholine binding to the M3 receptor. Acetylcholine acts on two vastly different classes of receptors, nicotinic receptors, with, an, with two subtypes, one at the neuromuscular junction of skeletal muscle and the other within the ganglia and the CNS, and the muscarinic receptors, which are widely distributed within both the peripheral and central nervous system. And there's an important, important point when it comes to this. And we'll see this on our next slide. You can see that there are many organs with M2 and M3 receptors, and these organs will be affected to some degree by these medications. And this explains the side effect profile of these, of these meds. So I think it's important to understand why these side effects happen. It's easy to memorize the side effects, but it's actually important to understand the physiology underlying them. Antimuscarinics can be divided into tertiary and quaternary amines, which differ in molecular size, molecular charge, and lipophilicity. Small molecular size with little charge and greater lipophilicity increases the passage to the blood-brain barrier within the theoretical potential of greater CNS side effects. Tertiary compounds have higher um, lipophilicity and less mole molecular charge. Quaternary compounds have greater molecular charge and less lipophilicity, which limits the passage of these um, compounds um, into the central nervous system. So let's look at some of the unique features of six commonly used medications. Tolteridine is a tertiary amine with predominant affinity for M3 receptors which are the important ones in the bladder. However, it will affect several other receptors in the body. So it's important to understand where these side effects come into play. Oxybutynin is also a tertiary amine with primary M3 selectivity, but also has M1 selectivity, which accounts for its CNS side effects. Oxybutynin has a three-pronged effect because in addition to causing direct myotrophic relaxation, um, it also has some um, local ana anesthesia. Trospium chloride is a quaternary amine, and this is the one that sort of comes up during board exams or oral board exams. With, it has non-selective atropine-like effects because of its polarity and because of its structure, it has limited penetration across the blood-brain barrier, which may make it valuable in the use of elderly patients. We will touch upon, though, um, the relationship between anti-muscarinics and cognitive effects a little bit later in this talk. The newer agents, although they're not so new anymore, um, this lecture has been adapted um, over the last five years, but at the time, the newer agents were solifenacin and darifenacin. We've been using them for a while now, and also fesoteridine. Um, uh, when they were in development, one of the advantages that, um, um, that they were thought to have was that they were even more selective to M3 receptors with possible less side effects compared to the other medications. When comparing the six different anti-muscarinic medications, there was an AUA guideline that was published years ago um, looking at OAB therapy, which showed that there was really no compelling evidence that one drug is better than the other when evaluating reduction in baseline urgency urinary incontinence episodes per day. Using qualitative analysis, there was evidence that across all medications, patients with worse urgent continence at baseline achieved the most significant improvement, and those patients with low baseline symptoms were more likely to experience complete symptomatic relief. This speaks to the importance of assessing patient goals before starting medications. Discussion of efficacy is just as important as the potential side effects that patients may experience. Um, and you'll see that when patients have the right expectations in the office, depending upon how bad their baseline urinary incontinence is, um, outcomes are improved simply by them understanding what the actual um, expectation of those outcomes um, is going to be. Here I, we list some of the side effects um, and their prevalence when it comes to anti-muscarinics. 
Uh, somnolence um, has been reported to be high as 12% when studied in oxybutyn. Um, the incidence of dry eyes is pretty uh, low, or the prevalence of dry eyes is low. Cardiac complications are extremely rare. Up to 10% of patients report constipation with no actual clear relationship between rate and dose. When we look um, at dry mouth, also known as xerostomia, up to 60% of patients complain about this. And I think that we um, are familiar with this complaint as a lot of patients choose to discontinue the medications due to this. Um, there is no clear relationship between rate and actual dose of dry mouth. Also no clear relationship across the medications. However, ER formulations, so those that are extended release, have been shown to have lower rates compared to immediate release medications. And this has been shown in studies looking at oxybutyn and tilteridine. Um, of course, we know that one of the major contraindications is narrow angle glaucoma. And I think one of the cases we're gonna talk about um, has a question about this, but it's important to remember this. And so when patients talk about whether they have glaucoma or not, it's important to confirm that it's narrow angle um, before deciding whether or not to um, treat them with antimyoscarinic medications. So now we're gonna talk about compliance with long-term continuation. In general, the quality of publications on antimyoscarinic agents is good many achieving level one status, which you will recall means large randomized placebo controlled trials. But the main criticism of these studies is that they have very short follow-up with most of them looking at patient outcomes up to 12 weeks. Um, what's important to understand is that um, discontinuation is, can be quite high even within the first 30 days. Fewer than half patients have been shown to actually refill their prescriptions. A lot of patients are lost to follow-up um, and don't even go on to third line therapies. Reasons for discontinuing reported are often that they did not work as expected. So patients basically feel um, as though their expectations weren't met, which again plays, the, that's where the important role of counseling when you're, when you're trying uh, medications and talking to patients about your care path comes into play. And a third of patients reported side effects that were bothersome. Again, these aren't so new now, um, but the drugs that were, um, the, the newer drugs compared to the, to the others, have similar rates of discontinuation. So just because some of them have more M3 uh, selectivity, there really is no difference. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the quality of these studies is actually quite high. The real question comes in, this has been very in vogue actually since I've been in practice. In 2015, there was a JAMA article that came out, then followed by several other articles in the last few years. Um, showing that there was a higher cumulative, um, uh, that there, a higher cumulative anticholinergic exposure was associated with an increase in the risk of dementia in, in older patients. Um, and, so, and also that the use of anticholinergic medications among patients with OAB was associated with an increased risk of new onset dementia compared to beta-3 agonists. And we're gonna talk about that medication next. The real question when it comes down to this, and it'll be interesting to see what, what the panel thinks because I, one of our cases, um, uh, is about dementia in our patients and it's there in its association with anti-muscarinic use is whether there's real association, um, whether it's just an association versus causality. There are a lot of confounders in a lot of these studies. Our patient population, because they're elderly, happen to be at risk for dementia as well at baseline. And so the, the causality portion is, is missing a bit, but I think a lot of us have become over the years more concerned about long-term use of anticholinergics and also first start um, prescribing in older patients. And I look forward to our discussion in a little bit. I'm gonna talk about Mirabegron, which is a beta-3 agonist. Um, this uh, medication uh, essentially is, um, uh, acts on the beta-3 adreno uh, receptors in the bladder and is mediated through the actions of norepinephrine. So that's the uh, neurophysiology to sort of remember and, ref and uh, refer back to the pictorial I showed uh, at the beginning of the talk. Uh, the um, uh, main uh, use of Mirabegron is obviously for OAB symptoms. It's not recommended in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. The definition of uncontrolled hypertension is a bit loose. Um, depending upon people's definitions, that's an individual who either has hypertension and is non-compliant with hypertensive, antihypertensive medications. It can also mean patients who are on multiple antihypertensives in order to control their blood pressure. Um, the most common adverse event um, is hypertension, but it also is, has been associated with UTI as a result of retention, um, headaches, which may, re, may be a result of um, higher blood pressures and in a very small proportion of patients, uh, dry mouth has been reported. Um, it is much less common 
um, when it when mirabegron has been studied head to head with the anti-muscarinic um, tolteridine in its um, extended release form. Dosing for mirabegron that's been noted to be safe and affected, effective is either 25 or 50 milligrams and it's administered daily. Randomized placebo-controlled studies documented that both the 25 and 50 milligram doses reach efficacy and safety and are maintained through 12 weeks of treatment. The quality of these studies are also level one, but there again have been no studies that have looked um, at the use of mirabegron or, or um, studies that have high quality that have looked at mirabegron beyond the, the 12 week period. We're gonna move on to the tricyclic antidepressants. So I'm talking mostly about imipramine, um, which has been used um, for a long time for the treatment of lower urinary tract dysfunction. Um, it's thought to have three different mechanisms of action. It is an anti-muscarinic with direct effects on the bladder, thereby reducing bladder activity. In addition, it works at the somatic nucleus of the spinal cord at Unos nucleus, um, which is densely innervated by 5-HT and norepinephrine terminals. Mepridine is thought to block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine within the synaptic cleft thereby increasing receptor stimulation, leading to increased activity of the pudendal nerve, causing contraction of the skeletal component of the urethral sphincter. Additionally, although not well understood, amipramine may also have an effect on the pontine micturition center. The end result of amipramine's use is increased urethral resistance and reduction in bladder um, contractility. Tricyclic antidepressants, again, namely amipramine, have been used in mixed urinary incontinence and are FDA approved for childhood and uresis. They have also been used in the treatment of patients with neurogenic bladder and particularly those with poor compliance, um, bladder compliance, that is not compliance with medications. Um, and in this clinical scenario, they are used as triple therapy and combined with an anti-muscarinic and an alpha blocker. The dose commonly used is 25 milligrams. At this dose, side effects are low, but do include dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and insomnia. And so it's important to discuss this with patients. Um, I think the, this medication is prescribed a lot less often um, than the other medications. In fact, it's probably prescribed rarely and used for very, very particular um, circumstances. Most of the published rates of effectiveness have been in refractory childhood, um, nocturnal enuresis, and in neurogenic to choose over activity. Uh, for mixed incontinence, the studies are level three as they are retrospective case control studies or case series. So um, I say proceed with caution and really sort of look at the data and understand that perhaps moving on to third line therapies after you've exhausted mus anti muscarinics and beta 3 agonists is probably uh, the way to go. Next, I'm going to talk about our neurotoxin, Botox. Um, so we're going to move on to the last medication that's actually an injected medication into the detrusor muscle of the bladder. We should all be um, familiar um, with this treatment modality. It is the neurotoxin Botox, which, produ which is produced by the Clostridium botulinum um, bacterium. We don't know the true mechanism of action for the smooth muscle um, component of its effect, but there is a proposed mechanism of action in skeletal muscle. It's thought to work at the nerve terminal, cleaving a protein called SNAP from the receptor on the nerve terminal. This then uh, blocks the release of acetylcholine. Um, and so we're gonna go through this mechanism a little bit later. It is a fair game question and it's important to understand if you're injecting Botox, you most definitely should understand exactly the way that it works from a neurophysiologic neurophysi um, perspective. Acetylcholine in the nerve terminals is packaged in uh, vesicles upon nerve stimulation. The vesicle membrane fuses with the inner wall of the nerve terminal, releasing the transmitter into the synaptic cleft. The process is mediated by a series of proteins collectively called the snare proteins. Botox taken up into the nerve terminals cleaves the SNAP25 component of snare, preventing creation of a functional fusion complex and thus blocking the release of acetylcholine. So hopefully everybody remembers that from their, uh, uh, their uh, undergraduate uh, understanding of how all of this uh, works. This is just a small little review for, for everyone. Uh, Botox was FDA approved for neurogenic overactive bladder in um, August of 2011 and for non-neurogenic overactive bladder in January 2013. It is contraindicated in patients with urinary retention. In those who have a hypersensitivity to any botulinum toxin, that should be pretty obvious, um, 
and if they have active urinary tract infection at the time of injection. Various doses have been studied, but the FDA approved 200 units for neurogenic and then 100 units for OAB patients. There are two different types of Botox that have been studied for OAB, and recommended doses for these types are very different, um, and they're listed here. The most common side effects are increased uh, post-void residual, which is also associated with urinary retention, and UTI rates are variable depending um, on how those UTI, um, how, what the definition of UTI is um, in uh, the studies that have been um, published, as well as the study population used and the doses used as well. There are several studies that show that Botox is better than placebo with reduction of urge urinary incontinence from baseline as the primary outcome. The majority of patients are found to have a significant clinical response with high continence rate, but the duration of effect is variable. And I think that most of us can say that that's our experience in the office as well. A recent large multicenter um, uh, or it's not recent, sorry, the next study I'm going to talk about is recent. A, a multicenter PFDN study that was led by Tony Visco, which was published in 2012, looked at randomizing patients to anticholinergics versus um, the approved 100 units um, of, of Botox and found similar reductions in mean urge urinary incontinence episodes per day over six months, but had much, but had higher complete urge incontinence um, resolution uh, with um, the use of Botox versus um, anticholinergics. So um, important data to show the benefits of uh, Botox over the use of anticholinergics. If you add the effect, and that's in this study, they counted pills and were able to make sure patients were compliant. But in day-to-day, -day, we know that patients are not always compliant, especially with antimuscarinics. So there's probably that added sort of benefit of Botox over um, the antimuscarinic um, pathway. Botox requires injections for continued efficacy, and it appears that about a quarter of the patients who had Botox therapy will eventually refuse continuing therapy, which I think is always surprising to some. This information is important to know with regard to patient counseling, and it may have to do with patient expectations. So if patients aren't counseled, that there's a chance that they may need to come back between six and 12 months to have a repeat injection. And if they're made to understand that it may last longer than that, they may realize that they don't want to continue having such a high maintenance treatment if it's determined to be high maintenance in their mind. Um, when comparing the cost of Botox to sacral neuromodulation, and this lecture is not on sacral neuromodulation and we're not gonna be talking about its efficacy, but it is important to talk about it and in relation to um, its use versus Botox, the results really have been mixed. And in an initial cost-effective analysis, Botox was more cost-effective than um, neuromodulation for refractory o OEB at two years, but was more cost effective. So it wasn't, but it was more cost effective after it was more cost effective after five years to do sacral neuromodulation because patients kept having to come back to the office for their Botox injections. In a recent publication by Harvey et al., um, both treatments were effective, but the high cost of sacral neuromodulation was determined to not be good value for treating UI compared to Botox. And so it sort of depends upon how you actually define your cost of effectiveness parameters. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's important to think of when it comes to the patient and what's important to them, it's making a decision about whether they want to come in and have repeated treatments, um, whether it's twice a year or every year, or every other year versus um, having um, a, a treatment that may be more um, costly from, an, you know, from a healthcare perspective, but requires a little bit less maintenance. And I think that's an important um, conversation to have with patients. Again, even though we're not focusing on sacral neuromodulation, I do wanna mention the Rosetta trial. That was the more recent study published in 2016 um, in JAMA, looking at Botox, um, 200 units versus sacral neuromodulation for refractory OAB. Botox had a greater reduction in six month mean number of episodes of urgency and continence per day. Um, the real what's up for debate is well, this was statistically significant. What's been really questioned was how clinically significant this difference is, but from a stati statistical standpoint, Botox fared better. Botox had greater improvement in symptom bother um, as well as treatment uh, satisfaction. There were no differences in adverse um, events. UTIs were more frequent with Botox, so this is important, especially in patients with recurrent or chronic urinary tract infections. It's important to actually take this into consideration um, with, in determining whether patients are candidates or not. 
the need for intermittent self catheterization was 8% at one month and 2% at six months. This is important uh, data to remember when you're counseling patients about downsides to Botox. Um, and sacral neuromodulation revisions and removals um, uh, were uh, occurred in about 3% of the cohort um, in, this, in this population that was studied. We're gonna now turn our attention very briefly because as you probably know, the care paths um, for stress incontinence don't usually involve medications, but it's important to talk about historically what's been thought about um, and what um, currently um, exists and also to help us um, think about whether or not um, pharmacologic management of SUI is even a reality and whether we should continue um, trying to develop medications that may help. So with SUI, they can uh, the two medications that exist are administered orally. We're talking about alpha-1 agonists um, as well as selective norepinephrine and serotonin uptake inhibitors. The uh, receptors are the alpha-1 adrenergic adrenoreceptors. Um, these subtypes are where norepinephrine take action and the potential site of action is urethra, the urethra, which is different obviously than ROAB care path where the targeted uh, receptors and mediators um, occurred in the bladder. So uh, when we're talking about alpha agonists, there's almost not too much to talk about, but again, it's important from a historical perspective to understand the, when this medication was used and why it was withdrawn. It was taken off the US market by the FDA because of cardiovascular problems, which shouldn't shock anybody. Um, other problems included sleep disturbances, headache, tremor, palpitations, and certain um, medications were um, associated with serious cardiovascular and CNS effects. Um, others were uh, associated with hemorrhagic stroke um, and others had um, my, more minor and not as severe cardiovascular effects, but cardiovascular effects nonetheless. In terms of selective norepinephrine and serotonin uptake inhibitors, we're talking about duloxetine, um, Cymbalta, which has been, um, which has been studied um, in the SUI population. Um, the main receptor mediator is the 5H2 uh, receptor, which mediates serotonin um, and alpha-1 um, receptors, which also mediates norepinephrine. Um, the serotonin and norepinephrine neurons, and this is again, review of neurophysiology, um, have axons that project from the brainstem to the spinal cord where their terminals densely innervate unus nucle nucleus, the sacral parasympathetic nucleus as previously mentioned, um, and the sympathetic nucleus in areas of the dorsal horn that receive bladder sensory information. The guarding reflex is facilitated by norepinephrine and the serotonin through their activation of the alpha one adrenergic and 5-H2 serotonergic receptors, respectively. Um, furthermore, these mediators, both serotonin and norepinephrine, inhibit sensor input from the bladder um, via 5-HT1 and 5-HT3 um, and alpha-1 adrenergic recept receptors, respectively, and results. this results in decreased stimulation of the bladder from the parasympathetic nucleus. So, this is all very complicated business, um, but I think, again, important to understand how it actually works um, and, um, and, and, uh, and to be considered. Um, Duloxetine was a drug um, which was up for FDA approval for SUI, but did not receive uh, approval. It, it can be used off-label and is used by some, and its prescribed dose is 80 milligrams. The main contraindication is uncontrolled narrow um, angle glaucoma and use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And there's an FDA black box warning for increased risk of suicide in young patients. Side effects include vomiting, constipation, headache, dry mouth, and fatigue. The most common side effect is nausea occurring in 25% of patients, and it's the main cause for discontinuation. The published rates of effectiveness for SUI showed um, when this um, medication has, has been studied, showed subjective improvement but only a small effect size and meta-analyses examining objective cure rates have failed to show an objective benefit over placebo. Studies, um, all studies looking at this medication have been short duration and withdrawal rates due to side effects were much higher than placebo. And the studies on this type of drug are graded as B. So they're level, barely level one, mostly level two evidence. And so again, I think you'll find very few people who treat SUI pharmaco pharmacologically um, but again, important to understand what people have thought of in the past and why or why not we use these medications. So this concludes my actual pharmacologic talk. I know that was a lot of neurophysiology, um, 
trust that it was um, not uh, super easy to put together, but I think it's important information for everybody to know and to review, especially when you're getting ready to take your board exams. And I look forward to doing our panel and discussing our cases as it relates to this. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferrando. That was a great and very in-depth presentation. Um, let me go ahead and just get set up here for the case presentations. I just wanted to remind all of the attendees to please submit any questions to the Q&A chat um, that we'll be addressing after we go through these two case presentations right here. Okay. All right, so case number one, a 67 year old woman presents to your clinic complaining of daytime urinary frequency, nocturia and urgency incontinence. She is currently restricting her daily oral fluid intake to less than 60 ounces per day, but reports no improvement. Her medical history is notable for well-controlled type 2 diabetes, and she has no prior surgical history. Her pelvic exam, post-void residual, urine analysis, and urine culture are all normal. After discussion of treatment options, she is interested in starting a pharmacological agent, but is concerned about because her friend told her that some medications will increase my risk of dementia. So I'm posing kind of these two questions together. The first question is, how would you counsel this patient about our current understanding of the relationship between bladder antimuscarinic medications and cognitive changes? And the second question is, do you formally screen for cognitive impairment prior to prescribing an antimuscarinic? If the patient is already on multiple classes of medications with anticholinergic properties, will you refrain from prescribing a bladder antimuscarinic and instead recommend an alternative therapy? So do you want to go around the room or how, how do you, this is your show, Dr. Bono. Oh, uh, well, maybe uh, I'd love to hear all three panelists' thoughts on the first question, and then the second question could probably be answered by one person, and if somebody had a, a, another thought, they could throw in their opinion on that. All right, well, why don't I start with the, with the first question, then whoever the last person on the panel is um, can do your, your final question. So, Perfect. you know, I, this, this has, the answer to this question has changed drastically in the last probably two years um, with, you know, mounting evidence. It was very, um, there, you know, it was un, unclear probably five years ago. The first sort of report started coming out, but there are lots of criticisms. And then they started doing, you know, studies where they're measuring CSF levels of trospium and doing cognitive evaluations at, you know, oxybutynin 30 milligram super high doses versus, um, you know, Enablex and showing that, you know, the Enablex or the uh, darafenacin wasn't. Um, causing any memory issues. So it wasn't really, you know, we always sort of knew um, that there was this potential because of the mechanism of action and you give, you know, cholinesterase inhibitors to people who have dementia. And so it makes sense, um, but we didn't really have really big, well-designed studies until I'd say about the last year. And when the JAMA paper came out a um, year or two ago, that started raising people's um, concerns. And then, you know, you mentioned, or um, Dr. Ferrando mentioned the, the WELP paper that just came out of um, uh, the British Journal. And, you know, the evidence is really mounting. And I am now clinically at the point where I try not to prescribe anticholinergics as first line therapy, even when there is some evidence to show that maybe it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier or it doesn't um, has an active pump or it's a big quaternary amine or whatever, because you don't know what people's um, CNS, you know, what the barrier is like. It may be compromised. You may have had some, you know, infarcts or some, some sort of, you know, everybody's a little bit different. So if there is a way to avoid the risk, I just try and go to a beta um, uh, adrenergic right off the bat. That does not always work with the insurance companies. And so many times you'll have to at least start and try um, an anticholinergic medication. And I try to, particularly in the older patients who are maybe at higher risk or have particular concern, we'll use the ones that have some at least um, short-term scientific evidence, the, um, the trospium and the darafenacin um, with respect to cognitive function. The fesoteridine has some data on use in um, the elderly population specific trials um, for use in elderly population showing no 
adverse CNS effects, but not specific memory um, questions. So, you know, unfortunately, this is like when we used to prescribe hormone replacement therapy all the time. You know, 20 years ago, every single patient of mine was on HRT in order to protect their brain and their heart and all that stuff. And then, you know, WHI comes along. So you, you really don't know, and it's a shared decision making. Um, and, you know, you kind of go through each of those steps and, and uh, make sure that patients are, are, are well informed. That's great. Um, Dr. Ferrando or Dr. Chinitsky, do you have anything to add to that? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll go. Um, I agree 100%. So now my, for, can you hear me well? Yeah. So my, my, my first line has been mirror background for quite some time. Um, unfortunately, and I even have like a smart phrase that says, we will start with mirror background. However, if insurance is not covering, we'll, we'll try aloxibutin it. And hopefully um, we can make some um, strides in changing that with insurance companies and convincing them that there is a, a significant risk that we should be looking at beta-3 agonists. Um, while the evidence, as Dr. Ferrando pointed out, is mostly associative, there is stronger and stronger evidence that there is some uh, cognitive changes. Um, and it, and it's also unclear how soon these cognitive changes start and how quickly they reverse. And certainly in somebody who already has signs of memory loss um, or any kind of cognitive impairment, I would not start anticholinergic medication. Um, so I, I, fear, I, I go to mirror background and then um, I may trial antimuscarinics and then I quickly move on to the third line therapy. Okay, and anecdotally from, from your perspective, how do you find the rates of insurance coverage for Mirabegron? Because I find our, our clinic, we, we also like to prescribe it, but also have a discussion with a patient of what's the backup plan gonna be if their insurance plan doesn't cover it and it's cost prohibitive to the patient. So in my experience, I would say, over 95%, we have to fill out some sort of pre-authorization. Um, and sometimes the pre-authorization works, um, but about, so about 50% of the time that we have to fill it out, it doesn't, that they require trial of a different medication. Got it. Finding that this is changing a little bit though, and I think Mirabegron was almost impossible to prescribe when it first came out and each year it's gotten better and better. I'm shocked now when I put it in how it's become a level one, level two preferred medication now. So I think it, with, you know, again, with trends, um, pro there's also probably been some pressure with all of the new data that's come out. Um, and so um, it, it, that situation has improved. There, there's a question from the um, in the chat that somebody has is saying, I'm being told that Sanctuary is no longer available in the United States. Are any of the panelists aware of this? And so do you know the reason why this is happening? I prefer to offer this medication to frail elderly women with high dementia risks. Um, and I will say Sanctuary, first of all, Sanctuary has been my go-to anti-muscarinic, if also it is covered, if I can't prescribe Mirabegron. I was not aware that it wasn't available in the United States anymore. I don't know if that's true or not. So I think it may be that, so there's two formulations of Sanctura. One is the BID dosing and the other one is the extended release. And I, I have a feeling it's the extended release that's been discontinued because I've been getting a lot of requests for refills of that medication, switching them to the BID. And it's because I think that's a generic now. Okay. Um, the problem with taking that, the BID dosing is you have to take it on an empty stomach. Um, Compliance is not great um, with that. You know, it's the 30 minutes before or a couple hours after, and and you know, a lot of these patients are on so many other medications that they have to take with food and, and that kind of thing. And so I think it's not the class of drug. I just think that the patent they probably lost the patent um, and it wasn't worth having the generics of the two. Yeah, I haven't come across it being not available, but I find that the prescribing it is almost as difficult as mirror background as far as insurance coverage. Um, and I'm just gonna make one more comment because I know in your in your other cases, um, Kristen, that um, you the five milligram oxybutynin is sort of, that is, that's the cheapest pill probably on earth um, mm -hmm. next to aspirin. Um, it is the, the, the most um, uh, side effects 
uh, the highest side effect profile because it has a very short half-life. You have very high peaks and valleys. And in order to get a steady state, you really need to be taking it three times a day. Um, and the, the anticholinergic burden, and in fact, it's the metabolite, the deoxy, that causes most of the side effect and um, constipation and dry mouth. And so when you take this medication three times a day, you're having really high levels of that metabolite metabolite that, um, that cause the side effects and the discontinuation for that. So if you have the opportunity to do an extended release, if you have to do oxybutynin, extended release is going to have much better compliance um, and lower levels of the deoxy um, because of the metabolism is um, the half-life is longer. That is a great point to, to point out there. Thank you so much for that. And on that note, um, this particular patient- Oh, let me answer your last question real quick. I do not routinely screen formally for, um, for cognitive impairment. It's okay. sort of one of those like gestalt things. Um, you know, you, you kind of know who you're, <laughs> you see enough of these little old ladies and you go, oh, I don't want to put, put you on this medication. So, yeah. Perfect. Um, let me really quickly move on to the next stem of the question, which is for this particular patient, she does decide to proceed with anti-muscarinic therapy and she is prescribed oxybutynin extended release, five milligrams Q day, uh, so not the uh, intermediate release. She returns to the office eight weeks later and reports no change in her symptoms. At this point, what is your workflow? Would you work on increasing the dose of that current medication or would you switch to an alternative medication at this time? I think there's different, everybody has a different office practice. So in my practice, I start somebody on medication if that's what they choose. And then I touch base with them every through, you know, my charting and through the help with my um, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, I touch base with them every four to six weeks. Um, and I ask them to, that we're going to, I tell them, we're going to ask you how much better you are on a scale of either zero to 10 or zero to hundred percent. And if there's any improvement, then I usually will titrate up the dose as long as they're tolerating side effects. If there's no improvement, I usually switch medications. Um, and I tell all patients, we're going to, if, if they're proactive and they want, because I feel like we lose patients before we get them to successful third line treatments. I tell them after, you know, two or three tries of either titrating or changing medications, I'm then going to offer you either Botox or sacral neuromodulation. So my goal is within 12 to 16 weeks of trialing medications, if they have opted to not try third line met therapy first and, um, is, is to do it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, same, same here. I, I have kind of similar conversation every time we discuss this with the patient. So at the, at the first appointment, I generally go over um, Mirabegran. I, I talk about anti-muscarinics. And then I, I really early on bring up third line options, um, but don't talk about them in detail, maybe give them some literature. And as soon as something is not working, um, we move on to a different medication. If it's if there is improvement, then I give them an option of increasing medication. I generally don't switch them to another antimuscarinic. I don't think there is a big difference in efficacy um, or side effect profile. So I typically uh, don't trial multiple antimuscarinic anti medications. Okay. Even, even the difference between like a tertiary versus a quaternary antimuscarinic? I don't think there's a lot of evidence that one works better than the other. Yeah, the only time I'll change a, a, a medic, an anticholinergic medication is if their limiting factor is side effect profile, yeah. not for efficacy. But but I also do try and maximize the dose because then you you run out of options and then you go back to the circle. You know they've been denied for their Botox and denied for sacral neuromodulation, denied for PTNS, and it's like okay, great. Now I got to go back to oxybutynin, you know, ten ER or. And the, the other option is to do dual therapy. So we know that doing anticholinergic plus a beta um, three is actually more effective than either one alone. So um, before completely abandoning, if they're really committed to taking um, medications as opposed to third line therapies, which can be for a variety of reasons, cost not being um, an insignificant one, um, the uh, um, dual therapy can be effective. Perfect. And yeah, we'll be addressing that later in one of the questions. And just really quickly for all three panelists, if you could just say, if you had a patient who's very proactive and wants to move through therapies as quickly as possible, what's the shortest duration of a trial that you would give a medication before you said, okay, we're going to move on to the next therapy? 
uh, no duration. If somebody wants third line therapy and their insurance covers it, I'll do third line therapy. Okay. It, and it, it depends on how motivated they are. It's sort of like, you know, with physical therapy, how, how long are you going to do physical therapy for? As long as they're finding improvements that they're getting better, that will keep going. We do have data that from all of these randomized trials for, um, you know, the FDA um, trials for these medications, it can be up to three months before you have a maximum effect. You'll see, you know, 50% reductions by, you know, sometimes even two to four weeks. But then there's also a continued, as you follow them out three months, you actually have continued benefit. Now, how much of that is the medication versus people's behavioral and dietary and all the other stuff that they're doing? I don't know, but, um, but three months, it does start to pl uh, plateau. So for me, realistically, it kind of happens within three months anyway, just from scheduling and everything. So, by, so I introduced the idea early, um, I, but it, realistically, it hardly ever happens before three months. So then they have a good trial. And if at that point they tell me, or oh, it actually is working now, then sure, it depends again, how motivated they are, how much side effects they're having. Um, younger patients don't, want to take medication for another 40 plus years if they're in their 40s or early 50s. So there's a lot of factors. Uh, realistically, it's been about 12 weeks before you get it approved, before you get the patient to see it, to see them back. Perfect. Um, we're starting to, the, these are great discussions. We're running a little short on time. We've only got 13 minutes left. So what I'm going to do for the remainder of this case and the next case is I'm just going to ask the questions just to facilitate a discussion. And that way we have about five to 10 minutes at the end for questions from the Q&A. So um, after, if you have a patient that you've started on anti-muscarinic therapy and eventually she comes in at a later point, in this case one year, and has a family member reporting some cognitive new onset cognitive issues, what period of time after you've discontinued anti-muscarinic therapy would you feel pretty certain that the, it's a side effect of the medication versus if their cognitive changes are going on for a longer period of time, would you recommend formal evaluation with either a neurologist or a geriatrician? Uh, let me pose this one to Dr. Ferrando. I have to unmute myself. Um, you know, I think we don't, again, we don't know that much about this. And it, you sort of, we've spoke to, we've spoken to some of our neurologists about this, but they also, um, they don't sort of timing wise, it's, it's, it's tough. So if it truly is medication induced and is reversible, which is also questionable too, we don't know how reversible it is. We don't know whether or not they're permanent impairments and we don't know whether or not the patient's baseline risk for dementia is also compounding this issue. Um, it could take up to three to six months for this to resolve. It doesn't really sort of just overnight stop, um, especially if again, their, their patient is at risk for dementia at baseline without the use of anti-muscarinics. Um, and in terms of when we would recommend that patient be evaluated by a neurologist, for me, I, um, I truthfully have not actually encountered this clinical scenario in my practice. So I'm sort of just theoretically saying things. I'd be interested to know if any of the panelists have, but um, after about six months of no resolution, I probably would make sure they were seen by a neurologist, maybe sooner. sooner. Okay. There's no downside to being evaluated as soon as possible. Yeah, stop, stop medication, send a neurology. Okay. Geriatrician, whatever, whoever does this. Perfect. Okay. Um, moving on to the second case, I'm going to skip the long intro and the prompt. Basically, the question that I mostly wanted to get at is, do you stop medications, either anti-muscarinics or beta-3 agonists, prior to performing a urodynamic study? Um, and does that change based on the circumstance that you're doing the urodynamic study? And if you do routinely discontinue medications, how long do you stop them for prior to a urodynamic study? Uh, Dr. Lucas, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, the direct, so I do stop the anti, I stop medications before your dynamics because I want to know what their baseline is um, without any, um, you know, intervention. And, you know, because you can clearly suppress DO and sensitivity and affect voiding function, all that. So, um, and, you know, the, it just depends on the half-life of the drug. So we know the half-life of Mirabegron is about 50 hours. So it's going to take probably, you know, about a week to 10 days to completely clear out of the system. Um, you know, half-life for, say, oxybutynin ER is going to be about 13 hours. And so that's going to be, you know, three to five days, that kind of thing. So you just figure, just calculate it based on that. Just based on my 
practice. I can't get somebody in for urodynamics within two weeks anyway. So I just say stop the stop them and then we'll do the, the bladder testing. So, um, you know, that being said, if I'm doing it to follow somebody with neurogenic bladder who has really, you know, DO or, you know, MS with detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, I actually want them to be on the anticholinergics because I want to know that their pressures are low and that the therapy is actually effective and um, that they're not, you know, popping off high pressures and damaging their kidneys. Excellent. Okay, let me get to the next question. We briefly touched on dual therapy with anti-muscarinics and beta-3 agonists. Um, how much time would you allow before you anticipated that you would have seen the full effect of dual therapy? And is that different versus just being on a singular agent? Uh, Dr. Tunitsky, do you want to comment sure. on that? Sure. Um, so again, the timing, I, I'm not sure there's any evidence for that. So again, typically I don't start patients on two medications right off the bat. They've either been on antimuscarinic or beta-3 agonist, and I'm adding another agent. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I, I expect to see the effect at, at maximum four weeks uh, and often sooner. Um, again, as I mentioned, I talked to them about third line. If they're really committed to medication, then we are, I often do the combined therapy. Okay, all right. And then I believe I had, this is um, a topic that I got a question about. So blood pressure thresholds, when you're starting a patient, a mere Begron, on a patient who's currently on a singular antihypertensive therapy, do you have a particular threshold that you use? If a patient's blood pressure increases from her baseline after starting Mirabegron, do you temporarily trial the patient off of Mirabegron for two to three days to see if it's related to the medication or simply recommend that she discontinue Mirabegron at that time? Uh, whoever would like to jump okay. in first. Um, I'll jump in, sure. Um, so, you know, the, the data about hypertension and beta-3 agonists actually has been kind of watered down over the time, and the increase is relatively minimal of uh, hypertension. That being said, I would not start somebody on beta-3 agonists if they're on three medications. I don't have a blood pressure number cutoff, but okay. I assess their compliance with the medication, and I, and I, and I see, if, like, if they've been like changing medications often with their cardiologist, it probably tells me that they're not well controlled. I sometimes may tell them to consult their cardiologist. Again, if their blood pressure will go up, we just won't know if it's beta-3 agonist or is it because their blood pressure is not controlled. Um, and with that being said, for the second question, I, um, I would discontinue if they're, if, so I also recommend that they self-monitor blood pressure for the first two weeks. We used to bring patients back when we just started with Mirabegron. Nobody does that. I don't think anybody does that anymore. Um, if they have ability to check their own blood pressure, I tell them to do that once a day. If they notice an increase, I tell them to stop. And if the blood pressure continues to be high, they need to, uh, they need to consult their PCP or cardiologist. So that's the summary. Okay. If you have a patient who's not on any antihypertensives and you're starting her on Mirabegron, do you recommend any sort of blood pressure check after starting the medication, whether it be in, because she's not going to be checking blood pressures at home. No. no. Okay. No. I've seen a lot of shaking heads from all three. Okay. In, in general, and I mean, if they have a blood pressure cuff at home, I tell them, you know, not a bad, bad idea to check it, but I wouldn't like, you know, tell somebody to go out and buy a blood pressure medication oh, or blood pressure cuff. I usually, then ask, I usually then ask them, why do you have a blood pressure cuff? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I had one today and her husband had it. She's yeah, like, okay. oh, I can check my blood pressure. <laughs> because, you know, when you're doing video visits, so that's, a, that's one of the things, yeah. you know, prescribing these medications without having an in-person evaluation. I do ask, you know, do you have, do you remember what your blood pressure was the last time you had it checked? And you know, or do you have a blood pressure machine at home? And so I'll ask them um, that. And if they have one, I ask them to check it just to make sure, because I have no baseline, you know, mm -hmm. the video. But you have a couple chat questions on there, Kristen. Do you want to look at those? Yes, absolutely. Let me bring those up here. I'll, I'll read the first one if you want. It's um, okay, basically cool. if you're on a long, if you have a long time user of anticholinergics with the new data on the dementia stuff, do you, um, do you, keep them on it, wean them off or discontinue cold turkey. So, you know, I've, I've got a lot of these folks in the last year who've been my chart messaging in now to get their refills on their oxybutynin, 
um, prescriptions. And I actually, you know, I'm pretty liberal about refilling if people are doing well up to three years, they're still considered part of your practice. So um, I'll refill those. But now I've been asking them to either make a MyChart video visit or come in for a discussion so that I can share this data. And a lot of them are like, oh God, I didn't know that that could happen. And if Mayor Begron is covered, then they prefer. And I just switch them over. I don't do a, I just stop. There's, I mean, it's not like this is life threatening or anything. It's all quality of life stuff. Okay, and then it looks like the second question is, um, somebody's had a lot of patients ask what their chance of memory issues is with anticholinergics. How do panelists approach this question with patients when they're starting the medication for the first time versus a patient? I, I feel like that's almost a blend of the two prior questions we had. Um, I mean, the evidence would suggest that it's somewhere, odds ratio is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.7, depending on which study you look at. Um, what population, age range, and duration of, um, of treatment compared to baseline. So, you know, obviously that baseline is going to go up at the older you get. Okay. Feel free, attendees, if you have any additional questions on the q and I think we've addressed all the ones that are on there right now. I had um, two additional questions of my own. One was, um, uh, would you use an anti-muscarinic therapy for a patient who reports a history of glaucoma but cannot remember if it was open angle or closed angle? So if I may, um, so again, this is one of the things that is um, listed as strict criteria for um, like contraindication. But if you look at actually ophthalmology literature, because there's a lot of anticholinergic drugs that are not just a, uh, OEB meds. Um, so first of all, the narrow angle glaucoma is hardly untreated hardly ever untreated. Nowadays, you're not gonna find a lot of people who are walking around with narrow angle glaucoma. So majority of those are treated and there's been several studies, one of them is prospective and from Japan that has um, demonstrated that on open angle uh, glaucoma and on treated narrow angle glaucoma, there is no side effects with anticholinergic medication. Um, and it's just, improbable that somebody is walking around with narrow angle glaucoma that's untreated, but you can always circle back with the ophthalmologist, which I've like epic message them and they, they're they like, what? what are they talking about? And go, go ahead and start the medication. Okay. So that has been my experience. Yeah, 90% of glaucoma is wide angle. Now, I don't think I would gamble and take a 10% risk of making somebody blind, but the, the one, important thing is a lot of narrow angle glaucoma is already treated. So if it's been, if it's being treated and they're being followed, then you can probably start the medication. So, you know, I've, I've not in my career seen anybody lose their sight from this, but it's definitely a test question and something that it's reasonable to have them just get their eyes checked. <laughs> right. And there's actually, in fact, uh, an ophthalmology, I looked at this up. So there's only been one case report of uh, anticholinergic triggered uh, narrow angle glaucoma. So just to kind of keep that in mind, but always be on the side of caution. All right. Well, I believe we've addressed all of the questions on the Q and A and we've only got one minute left. So I'm just gonna wrap it up here, but thank you so much. This was, a, this was a really lovely organic discussion between the three of you and your expertise is very greatly appreciated. Um, just to remind everybody, you will be prompted to uh, complete the questionnaire just to help provide us with some feedback. And the next webinar is gonna be on Friday morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, uh, May 22nd, which is evaluation and management of post-operative uh, pain by Dr. Butcherick. Um, we're really appreciative to OGS, uh, SUFU, and SGS for hosting these webinars. Uh, myself, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to these and being a moderator has been a great experience. Um, and it, for those of you who can't watch this live, you can also watch the archive version on either the Society's websites or you'll find it on YouTube if you search for OGS fellow lectures. Thanks again to uh, our speaker, Dr. Ferrando, and our panelists. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.